I'm actually going to wait to make some of my remarks because first I would like to bring to the podium um, the Consul General of the Boston Consulate, uh, Boston uh, Canadian Consul General in in Boston. I try. I, I had it written down and I lost it. Um, uh, Roger Kuzner to come up and say a few remarks before I go on. It's so so great to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs> After 19 years in politics, uh, I've been called so much worse. Uh, folks, it's, it's great to be here. We were here last year uh, for uh, the Fulbright uh, presentation and uh, had a great evening, and I'm very much looking forward to this one, uh, particularly uh, with, uh, uh, with this building Inuit uh, uh, directed futures. Uh, I, I, if I could just share one story, um, that, that's somewhat personal to any Atlantic Canadian, uh, just about the intersectionality between uh, history and its uh, ability to sort of deal with modern day problems. And I want to tell you uh, the story about Donald Marshall Jr. I'm not sure if any of you know him, but uh, uh, Donald Marshall uh, was um, accused of uh, murder in 1973, murder of uh, Sandy Seal, a young man in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, and served 11 years in penitentiary. Served 11 years in, in jail and finally acquitted by the uh, Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. Uh, you would think that that might be enough of a story, but that's not what uh, uh, the story I'm, I'm gonna tell you about. A number of years later, Donald uh, was spearing eels. He's, uh, he's Mi'kmaq, he's from uh, the member two uh, band in uh, uh, just outside of Sydney, Nova Scotia, and uh, he was out spearing eels, and um, he was uh, charged and convicted for fishing out of season, uh, which he said, uh, you know, my treaty rights afford me the opportunity to, uh, to uh, fish, um, uh, fish eels. Uh, that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and uh, it was in 1999, the Donald Marshall decision from the Supreme Court of Canada granted uh, First Nation communities in Atlantic Canada access to the commercial fishery. And uh, they, they had the right to uh, earn a moderate living and uh, for access for ceremonial uh, passage. Um, it, it was a, a great day for First Nations communities in, in Atlantic Canada and really presented them with the first real opportunity that they had had in generations. Um, the government of Canada was then charged with the responsibility of uh, making sure that uh, those First Nations communities had the tools that they needed, the expertise that they needed to enter into the commercial fishery and, and uh, provide for themselves and make that living. Um, they did this by meeting, there are 36 different uh, First Nations communities, met with them and, and sort of talked about uh, what was needed and uh, afforded them some access to, uh, to quotas of uh, the various species. There was, uh, they came into agreement with a number of them. There was one, in particular, one uh, community in particular that had a, a problem with giving up some of their access to accommodate our First Nations uh, communities. And, and this was in Burnt Church, New Brunswick. And the, um, it got tough when the First Nation fishers would be out on the water. Uh, there was a cutting of each other's uh, gear. There were uh, uh, boats ramming boats. There were high-powered rifles on the water. It was a, a very intense time, and Brendan, you may re recall back years. Yeah, very much so, it was very intense. Um, the, the, the history and resolution part comes in where uh, uh, Kevin Vickers, who's a bit of a figure himself, he's former sergeant at arms with the House of Commons and then ambassador to Israel, uh, to uh, Ireland, um, he was a superintendent for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at the time for, for, for the area. Uh, the fishers that had the problem with the First Nations communities were predominantly Acadians uh, from Acadian communities uh, throughout New Brunswick. 
And in Burnt Church, uh, as I said, before there was a loss of life, he went in there representing the RCMP and the, and the Crown and sat the Acadians down. And really, he, he did nothing more than give them that history lesson and talk about the connection to the land and talked about um, the, ex the expulsion of the Acadians by British decree back in 1755 that chased Acadians out of Atlantic Canada. 14,000 uh, Acadians were inhabited Atlantic Canada at the time. 11,000 uh, were, were chased off the property. And he reminded those Acadian fishermen, they said, the reason you are here is because the Mi'kmaq in this area took you and hid you, protected you, cared for your families, fed you, allowed you to stay in these communities until there was a change in the law and the, and the British uh, stepped back from the decree. And that's why you are in these communities today. And by Kevin Vickers sharing that true history, it, it took the emotion out of the issue. And it took, uh, it, 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 it came over the, the, the local uh, fishermen that it was indeed time to sort of pay back. Uh, now they fish side by side. Uh, our First Nations communities are some of the best fishers in the area. Uh, you know, everybody continues to have a great livelihood in the fishery. But again, just my point, I just want to sh uh, share that uh, with that opportunity for history and the problems of today to learn, and uh, I'm very much looking forward with the focus on uh, what's going on in the Arctic now, uh, with geopolitical issues, with uh, uh, the environment, with uh, critical minerals. Uh, I I'm very, uh, very much uh, looking forward to seeing what, uh, what the path forward is. So without further ado, welcome. Uh, thanks so much. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'll just give a, a, a bit of a formal introduction to Brendan, but I thank you so much for that. That Looking back and looking forward is, I think, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. And we also just uh, talked about the land. And so let me first just say the Institute of Arctic Studies at the Dickey Center, which, again, I, I direct here and have the honor of hosting the Fulbright Arctic Research Chair from, with Canada Fulbright. Um, we are the crossroads for multidisciplinary Arctic scholarship and global policy dialogues that center exactly what was just talked about, inclusion, justice, equity, and indigenous knowledge in our solutions that are co-developed for the Arctic and global challenges from issues from climate change to governance. And if we're talking about these issues of the land, it's important for us to acknowledge the land on which we stand. The Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth, and where we are right now, uh, sits on the traditional and unceded lands and territories of the Western Abenaki peoples, the traditional stewards of our forests, lands, and waters. We respect their connection to these lands and acknowledge the violence and hardship they continue to endure, and we give thanks for the opportunity to share in this place and to help protect it. And thank you again to, uh, three, uh, to our members from the Consulate General of Canada in Boston. I did have it written down. <laughs> Consul General Roger Kuzner and Senior Political and Economic Affairs Officer Mark Schock. Uh, you have been really, it's an honor to have you here. And it's been uh, such a nice place for you to come for these Fulbright events and celebrate our US-Canadian collaborations and knowledge sharing. And of course, tonight, we are absolutely honored to have here our 2022 Canada Fulbright Research Chair in Arctic Studies, Dr. Brendan Griebel, who will be giving the talk, Return to Source, Building Inuit-Driven Futures from Dartmouth's Stephenson Polar Collection. And But before I give a more formal background, let me just say what a pleasure it has been to host Brendan here and to have the opportunity to learn from his ideas his perspectives, and his extensive experience in every conversation, every shared meal. And despite his humility, he could not hide the fact that he is at the forefront of how institutions and individuals can and must 
practice knowledge co-production and meaningful engagement with Arctic indigenous community leaders and elders. He is an Arctic-based anthropologist and archaeologist who has lived and worked in Nunavut with Inuit communities and elders for over half of his professional career. He is the sixth in our distinguished line of Canadian scholars here at the, in Arctic Studies that we have hosted since 2017. Each one brings the generous support of Canada Fulbright as well as from Dartmouth's Dean of Faculty. And his talk today will explore the work that we've just mentioned about that could only be done between US and Canada. He has been a senior researcher with the Inuit-led Kit Kitkmiot Heritage Society in Cambridge Bay. And he will tell, about, uh, tell us about his work to digitally return the Inuit knowledge, culture, and experience um, that we host here in the Stephenson Collection back to the communities and homes of the original innovators of that knowledge. And after conversations with Brendan, I have always learned, I keep learning that this engagement is never a passive process. Just last week, and he'll tell us about it on Earth Day, his uh, Kitikmiut Heritage Society announced that their, their active engagement with indigenous knowledge leaders and the construction of a green cultural workspace, that, a design that is informed and led by Inuit-driven visions for sustainable development and adaptations to climate change in the North. To quote the press release, this work connects our values and connection to the land, our language, and our culture, and they will be restored. So this work is where I recognize that scholar, innovator, and practitioner are all uh, in Dr. Griebel's world. He received his Bachelor of Arts from McGill in anthropology, as well as his PhD then at the University of Toronto, also in anthropology. He's been a research associate in geomatics and cartography at Carleton, done research for the Wapata Center for Indigenous Visual Knowledge in Toronto, and served as a board member for the Archives Council of Nunavut. He's received significant funding for his scholarship and innovation, including grants from the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council to advance Indigenous cyber cartography and cultural research training. He is the creator of digital collection tools, one called uh, Arna Karvik. Arna Karvik to celebrate 50 years of artwork developed by Inuit women's, uh, an Inuit women's sewing collective. Another he, I saw was pa uh, something he created called Pattern of Change, 150 years in the life of the Inuit parka at the May Hakonga Cultural Center in Cambridge Bay. He's also principal of Intuit Research, specializing in helping northern communities document traditional cultures, lifestyles, and technologies. And he is the co-founder and director of the Museum of Fear and Wonder, curating and managing his own specialized collections of his own thoughts and rights. Uh, Brendan, it is such an honor to host you and to learn from you. Thank you so much for all you've given to our campus community so far, meeting with so many faculty and staff, and being such a wonderful colleague. I can't wait to hear your presentation, and I look, to, look forward to many more collaborations in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for the both of your lovely introductions. Um, so. Return to source, uh, building Inuit-directed futures from Dartmouth Stephenson Polar Collections. I wanted to stop, start the lecture today by, by sharing my deep gratitude to all of those behind this afternoon's event, uh, the Abenaki and Algonquin peoples on whose traditional lands we're sitting today, and Fulbright Canada and the Canadian Consulate for sponsoring my research chair at Dartmouth, and Dr. Melody Birkins, as well as the staff of the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth, the Dickey Center for Humanities, the Hood Museum, and Dartmouth's Rounder Library for their, their hosting of this research. I want to specifically thank the elders and project team from the Katikmet Heritage Society, who you will all be introduced to properly shortly, for driving the work they'll be presenting on today. Before beginning, I also want to add a, a quick note about this lecture's reference to Inuit identity. Now, the term Eskimo has been in popular use by non-Inuit for, for centuries, but was likely sourced from an Algonquin uh, pejorative term, meaning eaters of raw meat. Well, Eskimo continues to be a favored term by, by some of the northern indigenous peoples, primarily in Alaska. Canada has gravitated to the term Inuit, uh, which means the people in Inuktitut. Uh, it's, it's really a preferred endonym for the group, uh, endonym being a name that a group uses to describe itself. So throughout this presentation, I'll, I'll be using the term Inuit to describe the northern indigenous peoples of Canada, uh, but I've kept references to Eskimo in cases of historical citation and quotation. Uh, as a, a final housekeeping note, um, I know we have some archivists in the, the crowd today. Um, so th many of the images for this lecture uh, have been sourced from the Stephenson Polar Collection. Um, but I've chosen for reason of a 
reasons of aesthetics to, to shift all the citations to the end of the presentation rather than have them uh, getting in way of the images. Um, so you'll be able to, to see what all of these images are at the end in case you want to, to find them again. So now we begin. So perhaps because of the pandemic, the ongoing war in Ukraine, or simply my entering into middle age, I've really been reflecting a lot recently about ideas of trajectory. More specifically, the machinations of how we end up where we do. How we as a society, community, or individuals are sometimes set upon paths guided by forces larger than ourselves. I want to use the opportunity of today's Fulbright lecture to meditate on the complex role that, that academic uh, research, and anthropology in particular, has in determining pathways for the people and cultures they represent. I worked as an anthropologist in the Canadian Arctic, or have worked, uh, for the last two decades, and as such, try and be very cognizant of my profession's role in narrating other cultures. Well, many assume that documenting a society's language or their kinship structures or beliefs is, is something benign at best. Uh, the projections of anthropologists often become reality. They shape popular image of cultural identity. They provide fuel for policies and programs that are designed to reshape the present and future of specific populations. Over the last century, Inuit of the Canadian Arctic are one population that has been profoundly impacted by anthropologists' understandings and, and often misunderstandings as to how they are and should be positioned in the world. I want to further focus my thinking on the complex, complex legacies of one academic voice well known to Dartmouth College, that of anthropologist and polar explorer Wilhelmer Stephenson. Between 1908 and 1912, Stephenson organized the first expedition into a region of the Central Arctic whose inhabitants, the Inuinait, had until that point lived in near total exclusion from the outside world. From the accumulated data of his encounter, ranging from observations to photos, field notes, and material collections, Stephenson bore a people. He defined their name and origins. He outlined their character and beliefs and he speculated on their place and potential in the North. His documentation of Inuit included keen and incredibly rare insights into the daily life of one of North America's last indigenous cultures to be shaped by Western influence, a culture that in less than a decade would already be foundationally altered. So between 1906 and 1918, Stephenson went on three expeditions into the Alaskan and Canadian Arctic, each lasting between 16 and 48 months. Two of these he led himself, with specific research goals to meet and document the Inuit. Upon returning from the Arctic, he published two dozen books and more than 400 articles, becoming one of North America's leading authorities on the polar regions. Despite never again setting foot in the Arctic, um, he continued to influence the lives of those who lived there. His lectures, publications, and correspondences advocated for what he termed a friendly Arctic, which sought to overturn his era's preconceptions about the North and about its harshness. Within this narrative, the ingenuity of Inuit to not only survive but thrive under Arctic conditions became a call to Western civilization to do the same, to build the North into Stephenson's vision for a land that bore, in his own words, stately cities and empires of productivity. As uh, famously quoted by Stephenson and adopted by Dartmouth's own Institute of Arctic Studies as its motto, there is no northern boundary beyond which productive enterprise cannot go. So Stephenson's dream for a fruitful and prosperous Arctic defied common thinking at the time, but was a contagious seed to sow. Throughout the decades, his call for a north augmented by Western values and industry would be echoed again and again in Canadian politics, used as a platform to develop natural resources, to widen the scope of national sovereignty, and to foster a southern system designed to enhance the Arctic for the benefit of all Canadians, but not necessarily for the benefit of Inuit themselves. So contemporary statistics from across the Canadian Arctic make it clear that Inuit have seen few rewards from these national dreams for productivity. 70% of the population is currently food insecure, 50% living in overcrowded homes. Uh, there's a suicide rate 10 times the national average. These are the legacies of the past century's administration of the Arctic through political, financial, and, and value systems designed, um, or sorry, systems that never fit the land or the people that they were imposed on. 
Inuit haven't been silent subjects in this process. Mm -hmm. The 1970s saw a surge in political action by Inuit across North America to join voice in condemnation of rampant resource extraction and the dispossession of land. This laid the groundwork for Inuit land claim settlements to grant more local control over the Arctic and the, its resources. So in 1999, a land claim was implemented for the Canadian territory of Nunavut, uh, an Inuktitut term meaning our land, restoring Inuit oversight of a landmass roughly the size of Mexico in the Canadian Arctic. As Inuit achieved more political control and, and power to implement their own vision for governance, education and industry in the North, the challenge to define an Inuit-led structure and future for the territory remains a work in progress. Now, can the same anthropology that helped foster the current realities of Inuit life be used to facilitate a new trajectory for the North, when guided by the wisdom, priorities, and aspirations of Inuit? Inuit are increasingly looking to historical sources as a foundation for where newness can lie. In light of this, I want to use today's talk to explore how collections from anthropological expeditions over a century ago can serve new purposes when returned to their cultural source. In the hands of Inuit scholars and communities, archival and museum collections can be newly researched, newly understood, and serve as sources for inspiration uh, for Inuit self-determined futures. I want to further this theme by returning to another type of source, the pivotal moment of meeting between William Hurst Stephenson and Inuinite, a literal first encounter between North and South, as a way to consider how things could have and can still be uh, different from what they ultimately unfolded as. I argue that the field notes, photographs, and objects collected during Stephenson's expeditions allow us to access access an Inuinite world that still exists outside Western influence and, and beyond the anthropologist's mind. So for the last 15 years, I've been an anthropologist employed by an Inuit organization called the Katikmiat Heritage Society, located in the Western uh, Nunavut community of Cambridge Bay. So on this, this map of Stephenson's expeditions, we can see roughly where, where this community is. Um, the organization in, engages in culturally focused research and seeks to revive and celebrate the language, history, and culture throughout the Inuinite region. Um, the Inuinite region being, uh, here's a rough outline of, of where the group uh, occupied. So we're led by an Inuinak director and a board of 10 local elders, all of whom are actively involved in setting the agendas, the priorities, and methodologies for the research that we pursue. The impact of their guidance on our work is profound. None of this team is in attendance today, so I thought it best to let them introduce themselves through a short film recently put together to uh, outline why our organization exists. When we think of Canada today, we think of the North. We think of Inuit, Indigenous peoples, all of the First Peoples in Canada. With the sudden impacts of colonization and the way in which our people and our livelihoods changed. Our people have had to drastically change our way of life. The best way in which we can heal is to reinstate who we are by learning our traditions, learning our language first and foremost, which is intertwined with cultural activities. Our organization is a nonprofit located in Cambridge Bay. We work with a variety of elders and community members to research and revitalize everything related to Inuit Night. We work all the time to pass on key aspects of who we are as a people through sewing, through carving, tool making, language learning, talking to our elders. It's just so hereditary and so important to pass on that knowledge. In essence, we as a people may feel extinct if we lose our language. It's a fundamental piece of who we are and the way in which we learnt how to navigate, where to go hunting, where to camp, all of those different things that are intrinsic to a way of life which we're still very proud of and excited for.
Language is the fundamental key to identity and everything stems through language. So to be able to pass on language and fundamentally pass on our ancestors' knowledge is key to keeping our people strong, passing on who we identify with as a people. And it's very important to, not only to us, but Canadians as a whole. We want to be proud of who we are forever. And to be proud of who we are, we need to know who we are. A major role of my work with the Heritage Society is the recovery of critical cultural information from early anthropological sources. Together with elders and cultural experts, we find ways of isolating Inuit knowledge from the broader context of historical research and reapplying it in the contemporary world. As referenced in the film we just watched, the 21st century has eroded many of the structures that united Inuit uh, with their language and land. For hundreds of years, Inuinite lived according to seasonal migration within a defined landscape and developed a high level of cultural synchronicity with their environment. Relying on their surroundings for the tools they made, the clothes they wore, the food they ate. Such was the extent of merger between identity and environment that Inuinite family groups often named themselves for specific features on the land that they moved through. The Koloktokmiut, the people of the rapids. Ikaloktokmiut, the people of the fishing spot. The term Inuinite quite literally means the people in the Inuinuktun language. And this was very accurate. Uh, they're, they're, uh, through their limited social contact, their independence and self-sufficiency, uh, they were genuinely a people unto themselves. In 1910, William Herr Stephenson breached that solitude as the first major encounter with Western culture. Well, there'd been occasional contact with earlier European traders, uh, explorers, and First Nations to the south. These encounters were often tentative and brief, with few attempts on either party's behalf to, to fully understand the other. So here's the uh, two faces of William Herr Stephenson, the scholar and the anthropologist. The very reason for the beginning of my work in the North, Stephenson noted, was a desire to learn what I could about the Eskimos. So being of Icelandic descent and born in Canada, Stephenson was not unfamiliar with the North. Throughout his education, he delved deep into the study of his own Norse heritage, writing extensively about traditional diets of Iceland. He cut his teeth as a researcher of Inuit culture in 1906, when at the age of 27, he was part of the Anglo-American expedition, uh, where he worked primarily on Herschel Island, which he described as a sea wolfy town of whalers and Inuit located in the Mackenzie Delta region. While there, he had a fleeting encounter with this man, Christian Klenkenberg, a Danish trader just returned from wintering a ship near Victoria Island, further to the west, an island labeled at that time as uninhabited on Canadian government maps. Klenkenberg told Stephenson of a hitherto unencountered group of Inuit living there, many of whom possessed fair skin, light hair, and blue eyes. He proffered a small collection of copper needles and knives, exemplary, he noted, of their reliance on the soft metal and their creation of tools. So suitably mesmerized, Stephenson vowed to return to the region in, super, in search of the group that he and, and through him the rest of the world would soon be calling the Copper Inuit, or more controversially, the Blonde Eskimos. By the fall of 1908, Stephenson was back in the Arctic and in hot pursuit of these mythologized people. Through a combination of charisma and media sensationalism, he raised funds from the American Museum of Natural History and Geological Survey of Canada for a second Arctic expedition to encounter these isolated Inuit with European features. Even in its inherent absurdity, a search for a long-lost European tribe who had also never encountered Europeans, the story was both highly sellable and hotly debated. Adding to its excitement was that Stephenson and his companion, zoologist Rudolf Anderson, planned to pioneer a new era of Arctic exploration in which no food, nor clothing, or housewares would be brought along from the south. 
The researchers would live in tandem with those they researched. So the spring of 1910 saw Stephenson moving steadily west towards Victoria Island. And then on May 13th of that year, first contact with Inuinite was made. Here's the page of Stephenson's diary from 1910, uh, writing about that, that contact. The people look clean, Stephenson notes, and are models of good behavior. In fact, they have manners towards strangers such as I do not suppose any white men have ever honored themselves by showing to any branch of the Eskimo race. The sum is courtesy and good breeding and generous kindness. For the next two years, Stephenson would live, travel, and hunt with Inuinite as a means of developing a written and visual record of their lives. Uh, here are some images. This is um, Kanaoyuk and uh, Kila uh, Aknaoyuk uh, in front of their tent, um, a group he was traveling with around uh, 1916, um, fishing, fishing from a stone weir using the, the uh, kakivak or fish lyster. Stephenson's diaries are heavy with descriptions of kinship and family names, notes on language, diet, tattoos, and taboos. Of living with Inuit, he wrote, they took me into their houses and treated me hospitably and courteously, but exactly as if I were one of them. They gave me clothes to wear and food to eat. I helped them in their work and joined in their games until they finally forgot that I was not one of them and began to live their lives before my very eyes as if I were not there. This gave me a rare opportunity to know them as they are. In his letters and communications throughout the expedition, we also get a sense of Stephenson knowing Inuit not so much as they are, but as who he wants them to be. Uh, we've covered the last mile, he writes in one letter to his, his sponsors. We found what we set out to find, a new people, less contaminated, more numerous than anyone thought possible. He goes on to outline the physical similarities between his own genetic Icelandic heritage and the roughly 40 lighter-skinned, uh, lighter-featured Inuit uh, identified among the Victoria Island groups, going so far as to detect the cadence of Old Norse language in their speech. There is a strong possibility, he posits, of some connection with the lost Norse colonists of Greenland who disappeared from that region around 1450 AD. So these are Stephenson's blonde Eskimos. I think it's, it's a little, he believed they had very European features and I think through some, uh, some careful tinting of this glass lantern slide, they might come off a bit more blonde than they actually were. So Stephenson returned from a second expedition to much fanfare as exemplified by this headline in the, uh, the New York Sun. In case people are having trouble seeing it, uh, the, the bottom reads, thrilling account by the explorer of a search in the Arctic for a lost race of white men. So amidst his media success and, and preparations for another expedition, Stephenson began to lay the groundwork for a campaign to bring his own vision of civilization to the north. He believed the role of the anthropologist aligned with that of pioneer. Even if an anthropologist were to bring home no surveys nor scientific information, Stephenson writes in his book, The Friendly Arctic, he would still be a pioneer, a less sanguinary but comparably useful Daniel Boone opening new lands to the frontiersmen who bring commercial development in the wake of the pioneer. There may no longer be a far west, but there is a far north with that same nebulous and glamorous future within which so rise stately cities and empires of productivity. This thinking would culminate in his 1922 book, The Northward Course of Empire, citing the northward march over time of the world's great civilizations to colder and colder climates, from Middle Egypt to Constantinople to Scandinavians, Stephenson speculated that the Arctic was the final frontier for social and economic development. This would be aided, he noted, through large-scale domestication of musk ox and reindeer. Also through the use of dirigible airships and a shift in public attitude to find comfort in Arctic temperature and seasons. The Inuitite Stephenson encountered during this trip served a somewhat conflicted role in this vision. On one hand, Stephenson greatly admired them as a model to follow, citing their soundness of health, their self-reliance, and happiness with their state of life. If only we leave them, these people alone, Stephenson notes, they would be perfectly all right. At the same time, however, Stephenson openly advocates for their change, speculating on what Inuinite can further accomplish through intervention from the South. Their intelligence, he writes, lies fallow, lacking opportunities of instruction and development. He's equally troubled by their deep-rooted belief systems, which he sees as guided by the supernatural, rather than what he calls the natural logic of Western rationality. 
True to Stephenson's vision, the southern tide of civilization was quick to roll into the north and was equally quick to test the fabric of long-established Inuitite lifeways. By the 1920s, trading posts had moved into the area, encouraging Inuit to leave subsistence hunting for the pursuit of fox furs, which could be exchanged for Western luxuries. The trading posts were soon followed by other institutions, the RCMP, the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches, each bringing with them a different brand of foreign order. As Inuinite navigated the realities of Southern administration, town living, residential schooling, wage economies, practices associated with living on the land became less used. This in turn brought about the gradual disappearance of the highly customized technology, terminology, and social relationships that accompanied these activities. The Inuinaktun language withdrew from homes and separated from everyday use. In northern communities today, there's a common understanding that the traditional ecosystem of Inuinite culture is, is not a thing of the past, but an enduring cultural state that requires uh, active engagement and maintenance. The growing distance between Inuinite and their ancestral language and life ways is not envisioned in terms of loss, but rather dormancy, with foundational cultural knowledge said to be sleeping, waiting for new generations to revive it. So how do we reawaken this important knowledge? One way to bring knowledge back is through access to source material. Tradition continues to be embedded in the memories, skills, and technology of modern populations, but there's also a need to gain entrance to knowledge no longer practiced or part of collective memory. The Inuinaktu a name for a place no longer traveled to, manufacture techniques for a tool no longer used, the cut of a parka uh, that is no longer worn. This information offers slumbers, or often slumbers, in the collections of uh, museums and archives and memory institutions around the world. Anthropologists such as Stephenson have been recording Inuit knowledge in the relative permanence of field notes, photos, objects, drawings, maps, and lists of terminology. These records often represent Inuit knowledge received directly from Inuit experts, as interpreted by a non-Inuit anthropologist. Stephenson channeled cultural information through his personal backgrounds, interests and preconceptions, uh, the limitation of his linguistic abilities, the tensions of his expedition sponsorship, which required something sellable in return. The ability to reanalyze these records as uh, Inuit knowledge requires that they be reclaimed, returned to fields of expertise residing in the North as fodder for research, replication, and integration back into Inuit lives. So this brings us to the Stephenson collections at, at Dartmouth College. So here's a, a picture of Stephenson uh, teaching students of Dartmouth how to build igloos. Stephenson's association with Dartmouth began in 1929 as an occasional lecturer. Around this time, he began compiling a vast private library of both his own and others' uh, Arctic publications and correspondences, which grew over ensuing years alongside his reputation as an Arctic scholar. In 1947, Stephenson was appointed to the position of Arctic cons uh, consultant with uh, Dartmouth College, a position he would hold until the end of his life, during which he provided lectures, courses, and advice to students and faculty. Stephenson's vast Arctic library accompanied him to the college, where it was acquired as part of the institution's permanent holdings in 1951 through a combination of donation and purchase through alumni funding. The Stephenson Polar Collection resides today at Dartmouth's Rauner Library. It's, it's really a behemoth of knowledge, consisting of over 5,000 printed volumes, 20 linear meters of vertical ephemera files, 25,000 photographs, and hundreds of maps and manuscripts. Of most importance to the research being described today are Stephenson's own papers included within this collection, over 30 linear meters of journals, correspondence, diaries, reports, and manuscripts spanning a 60-year career as an explorer and scholar of polar regions. As summed up by Philip Kronenvet, the uh, former Special Collections Librarian to Dartmouth, Steph's papers are among the richest and most important bodies of polar manuscript material, both published and unpublished, available anywhere. The Stephenson Collection examines the polar world from many perspectives, that of explorers, anthropologists, the military, Arctic researchers of all descriptions. Inuit voices, however, are rare. One notable, uh, notable example uh, being the diary of 
and historical account of Ada Blackjack, uh, an Inupiat woman and sole survivor of the failed Wrangell Island expedition organized by Stephenson in 1921. So if not created by Inuit, to what extent can the Stephenson Polar collections be considered as containing Inuit knowledge? Inuit knowledge relates to specific cultural engagements, understandings, and ways of being in the world. It's, it's not qualified as much by its form of containment or transmission. It can be stories, songs, language, person or place names, but hinges on the ability of its receiver to find a place uh, for its information within the larger cultural ecosystem of Inuit life. The question ultimately boils down to whether or not Stephenson was able to capture these details in such a way that they can be re-identified, isolated, and integrated back into Inuit society. So for the last three months, I've been concentrating on finding Inuit knowledge within Stephenson's expedition field notes. So Stephenson maintained an almost daily diary while living with Inuit. His volumes contain hundreds of pages with vocabulary, descriptions of events, travel routes, drawings, geographical names, all of which can be extracted as discrete points of knowledge uh, about Inuit life. But using diaries as an authoritative source for cultural knowledge is problematic because the author himself is so present in them. His reports are, uh, are peppered with poetic verses. He was a, an avid writer of poetry. Um, Stephenson's thoughts can be heard, his interests and fears, his ruminations and reservations. His, interestingly enough, his presence is also felt throughout his diaries by their omissions. Perhaps for reasons of posterity, he was really cautious about what he included in his journals. Content is scratched out where earlier judgment or assumptions are regretted. Some writing is rendered in Icelandic text to make it illegible to others on his expedition. Among his most controversial omissions is a lack of any documentation surrounding his own siring of a son with Panechabluk, an Inuk woman in the employ of his expedition as a seamstress and, and assistant. So over the last three months of my Fulbright, my work has gravitated towards the retrieval of three specific types of information. Firstly, language, which is what we're looking at right now. So this is a close-up of one of the many vocabulary lists kept by Stephenson. Having no written forms of language, Inuit have honed the spoken word as the principal way to contain and express their world. Uh, it's history, it's memory, it's a way to transfer knowledge to others. But the Inuit lexicon has, has greatly diminished over the last century, with only about 500 speakers currently remaining. The discovery of new terminology quite literally brings the forgotten concepts they describe to life. The word auktok, as seen on this page, describes a particular way to approach a seal by crawling on the ice. As annotated by Stephenson, it applies mimicry of the animal and a physical proximity required by traditional hunting tools. Such words easily go dormant in a language when the practices behind them are no longer used. Due to the inherent similarity of the Inuit language family, Stephenson's uh, earlier studies in the Western Inuit dialects during the Anglo-American expedition made him possibly one of uh, North America's only examples of an anthropologist being able to speak the language of an indigenous group at the very moment of their first encounter. So I've also been looking to Stephenson's drawings as reference for cultural knowledge. So this image uh, of a woman in inked into his journal or documents tattoo designs a once prevalent practice among Inuinite women, which disappeared due to religious condemnation. Each tattoo a woman received tells a story about her life and identity, often through a visual repertoire of symbols widely understood by the community. By recording these tattoos, Stephenson has captured a larger narrative of the specific woman's life. Tattooing was such a strong identifier that we see Stephenson recorded again and again in his censusing of individuals from each Inuinite group he visited. So this running record, kept by Stephenson, of, of hundreds and hundreds of Inuinite is a, is a testament to the somewhat conflicted nature of his recordings. So it combines incredibly value cult or valuable cultural information about each person's identity, so their, their name, their, often their name, their kinship and relationships, their tattoo markings, you can see them to the side. But it also incorporates imported markers of personhood, such as cranial dimensions and facial index scores, uh, the measurements of which served as key tools for Stephenson to form uh, arguments about Inuinite intellect and race. 
uh, and the possibility of their distant European uh, ancestry. So other points of overlap with Inuit knowledge I've been researching has been photographic collections. So Dartmouth holds two major photo collections by Stephenson um, and his expeditions, roughly 700 hand-colored uh, glass lantern images and 1,200 photographs. Most of these have been digitized. Well, many of these photos, such as the one we're looking at right now, have a, an element of artifice about them, and being staged to document Stephenson's research interests, they still manage to capture a wide variety of other details that serve as memory prompts and technical guides. Here's a great example of uh, the woman Higalak um, sewing in front of her tent about 1916. So regardless of the photo's original intention, it allows contemporary seamstresses visual access to the patterning of clothing. Um, it provides insights into the practice of amulet use at the time. These are some uh, caribou foreteeth that are attached to the front of Higalak's parka. Um, these are also very important to the identity of the wearer. So in many cases, the power of these photos is, is really just as simple as the opportunity they provide uh, for Inuit to actually see the faces of their ancestors. So over the course of his two expeditions, Stephenson oversaw the collection, of, uh, collection and shipment of, of thousands of objects, uh, representing a full spectrum of domestic, hunting, and, and spiritual activities. Unlike later Arctic collections, Stephenson's contains no tourist or trade materials and can be understood as a material correlate of Inuinite life before outside influence. These collections are, are mostly housed at the American Museum of Natural History and Canadian History Museum, both funders of Stephenson's expeditions. But some personal collections, uh, augmented by materials acquired from later Arctic researchers, have still found their way into Dartmouth holdings. So these, uh, here are some early Inuinite objects that are currently being held at, the, uh, at Dartmouth Hood Museum. So these objects gain importance as both blueprints for technical reconstruction and material traces of a wider social and cultural and environmental context surrounding their original manufacture and use. So now that cultural insights have been identified in Stephenson's records, how do we return them to Inuinite? For museum and archival collections to become sources for, for Inuit knowledge, some form of connection has to be made with northern communities. It's ideally one in the flesh, so to speak, something interactive, tactile, and engaging of the senses. But what if uniting individuals in historical collections isn't physically possible? The realities of repatriating material to the Arctic are complicated with few facilities, staff, or, or training to care for and preserve them. Bringing Inuit down to southern collections is also not always a possibility, uh, being prohibitively expensive and often difficult to arrange. So over the last decade, the concept, the concept of digital repatriation or, or digital return has helped bridge indigenous groups with a remote cultural heritage. So in theory, it's, it's simple. It's the digitization of collections and knowledge from museum and archives and the transfer back to source communities through virtual means. But in practice, it's often more complicated, uh, requiring strong working relationships and a negotiated balance of different perspectives and priorities regarding how culture should be represented online. So the Katikmiat Heritage Society started its work in digital return about 15 years ago. The main issue for us back then was finding a suitable digital platform. We explored off-the-shelf software, but found most to be too limiting in terms of its structure and functionality. Most simply couldn't arrange or display Inuit knowledge in ways that upheld its larger context and meaning. So in 2006, we partnered with the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, to consider the specific digital needs of Inuitite culture and custom develop virtual platforms to support them. At the time, the Geomatics Center was pioneering a new cyber cartography, uh, cartography framework called Nunalit, designed to facilitate mapping input by non-specialists. There were different qualities, uh, or there were several qualities about this framework that immediately struck a chord. It, it was open source, uh, so all of its code is publicly available and non-proprietary. Uh, no one owns it, no one profits from it. Uh, it's also what's referred to as a distributed network, uh, meaning that it connects multiple users uh, through the same underlying system. 
So a benefit for this is that as users shape the framework to their specific needs, any new uh, functionality, uh, features, or upgrades developed by one user is automatically available to the rest. So the cost of maintaining the system over time is, is equally distributed, making it more sustainable, especially for indigenous communities who are, who are uh, Nunaleet's primary uh, user. So over the ensuing years, we've used Nunaleet to create numerous cultural atlases that map out digital landscapes that are truer to Inuit understandings of the world. But in, 19, or in 2019, we set our sights on using Nunaleet to develop a, a customized collections management system. Um, specifically for the purpose of digitally returning museum and archival collections. So we call it the Inunite Knowledge Bank. This platform helps users access, document, and, and recontextualize cultural items. It centralizes a vast number of digitized objects and records from different institutions and really seeks a more culturally emic approach to their organization, relation, and display. Um, so I believe the, the Knowledge Bank currently has about eight terabytes of, of digital data uploaded into it across probably about 12 to 14 different institutions. So I'll kind of explain how it works. Uh, like many systems, um, it allows to filter categories or basic search functions of the material. Um, we'll type in Stephenson here. Um, but more importantly, it's very visual. It, it has visual tiles, which, um, which allow easier access. and. So each of these records has the integral information from its host institution. You'll see it on the side here. This is its museum record. But users can go in and change this. They can overwrite anything in there, edit it, um, adjust it as they see fit. So this program also allows users to create a broader context around these materials. So you can see the materials themselves. This is the photo. I can download it. But users can also submit other materials that they feel enhances the context of this piece. Um, so here's a, uh, a more contemporary video of an igloo making workshop we did several years ago, and which can be used to kind of qualify these historic resources. So users can also go in and directly contribute information. Um, so this is a picture of Panakabluk and actually Stephenson's son, Alex, as well, in the photo. But we'll add Panakabluk. Um, they can be added by voice. This is a picture of Panakabluk. So people can speak directly into the system, also through video. This is a picture of Panakabuk. So it creates these very simple ways for communities to be able to start layering this, these collections in different contexts. Um, one of the, the recent pieces I've, of work I've been doing over the last two months of, of my Fulbright has been working with the Geomatic Center to to even make this process easier. Um, so we've been working on implementing tagging where community members can go in, find similar, similar media um, records. So right now we're going to find everything dealing with, with architecture. Um, they can go through all of the records, pick them out, and start cataloging them. Um, so this can be done with, uh, we'll add house here as well, just because these were all house pictures. Um, so this can be done with indigenous language. It can be done with Inuinuktun to start layering, layering the materials in, uh, in language. It can be done with person names. If you can, you can go and find your ancestors and start picking them out from all this material. Um, one of the things I, I appreciate most about this system is, is really its flexibility. So what this system can do is um, it can share its underlying data with with other, other platforms to kind of visualize it in different ways according to different needs. So uh, Melody had, had mentioned the Arnakarvik platform, uh, which we're working on right now. So this is a, a collections platform celebrating the 50th anniversary of a women's uh, sewing collective in Tolokiwak, Nunavut. Um, because these were kind of, a lot of the earlier products were commercial, they were all sold outside the community. Um, so this community has been left with with nothing in the community that they can physically reference from this collection. So what we've been doing with, with this platform is, is drawing out data from this larger knowledge bank um, and having working with the community to find a way that the, uh, they can access the information in ways they want to. So it is a lot more fine-grained uh, uh, searchability through, through artist names, examples, or, or, uh, or different objects. The user interface is easier. They can go in and find these records and build into them, leave oral records or uh, video records as well. 
Um, and to date, we've put together several, I think, that, or maybe about a thousand objects and archival records in the system. Um, and what we've been finding is that a lot of community members are now donating them to the system. So they're not just coming from museums. Community members are using this as a, as a repository, as a, a knowledge bank for their community, which is specifically its intention. So this is another system that we built several years ago for the expedition records of uh, Nud Rasmussen. Um, so he traveled with the Danish Fifth Thule expedition through the Inuinite region, uh, across the whole Arctic, actually. Um, but he was in the Inuinite region around 1923. So what we've done with this is, is extracted the Inuit knowledge from all of his reports, but we've focused on geolocating it. So you can go into his expedition route, you can find groups or camps he encountered along the way, and it will bring up all of the information related to it, the families that were there, his pages of writing about them. You can also go directly into these categories. We'll, we'll choose people, for example, and see all the people we documented. Choosing one person will bring up all the documentation related to that person, uh, the songs they sung, their family names. You can also move directly into the reports themselves, and. For each page, we've isolated all of the Inuit knowledge from it. Um, so a page will bring up all of that knowledge that's been extracted. And, um, and then users can then further navigate through that knowledge. They can see a person they want in that page and then find out about the life of that person, click on them and find everything related to them. So they are able to move through these large webs of association rather than kind of the typical structure of drop-down folder structure of a database. Okay, so um, despite all of these platforms being, being virtual, we really work hard to ensure that the knowledge they contain is mobilized in tangible ways. So one way we do this is by housing all of our platforms in a dedicated server at a center in Cambridge Bay so that we can literally show individuals where their contributions and knowledge is sitting. Um, most knowledge on the internet exists somewhere out there in the ether. It's probably in a server farm in California somewhere, but we keep everything on site. So for elders, we can actually show them a location. We also use these platforms as an opportunity to bring generations together through their respective strengths in, in old and new technologies. Perhaps the greatest practical value of these platforms comes from their use as a research base for, to create new trajectories for the North. And, this is what I really want to talk about for the final section of my talk. I want to consider how the Stephenson collections, once returned, can be applied towards real world change. So being about three months into my Fulbright research, it's really difficult to say at this point uh, what specifically the Stephenson Polar collections might become in the hands of Inuit experts. To give a sense of some possibilities, I want to, to very briefly discuss three ongoing projects at the Kitukmet Heritage Society, uh, for which Inuit knowledge either has or is in the process of being recovered from Stephenson's records. So these are very different projects, but I think as, as case studies, they're really united in their consideration of how larger systems in the North can be different, how they can be more Inuit. Um, they all really use historical materials to form new possibilities. So the first program really seeks to revive traditional modules of education in the North through technology and, and skill revitalization. So this glass lantern slide was taken during Stephenson's uh, 1913 to 18 expedition. In the foreground, you can see a series of, right here, a series of flattened boots. Um, uh, they're, they're a traditional form of boot uh, sewn with delicately crimped soles um, and used in drum dances and other more kind of formal events. Um, People sometimes call them fancy boots. Um, so when we began thinking about a program to revive this boot style back in 2019, uh, there was only one elder remaining in the Arctic, who, who uh, Mary Quidlock, who remembered how to make them. So bringing together the archival documentation we had from Stephenson, as well as several pairs of the actual boots uh, that he collected up there, these are from the Canadian Museum of History, um, and of course, Mary Quidlock, um, we, we formed a, a program that was called Kihima um, And I just want to show a quick video about why programs like this are important and different. Having my mom and my grandmother here and being a part of this with them 
it's it's special because they teach me and I help I learn and I help to teach others so that these skills are not forgotten, they're not lost. Even when uh, this program is over, we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to teach others in the community. So multiple of these bootmaking workshops have now been held, um, deepening both the knowledge and language surrounding the tradition and, and strengthening the intergenerational relationships uh, required for their transfer. So the second application of Stephenson's collections I wanted to consider deals, oddly enough, with business. So in his field notes, Stephenson's very attuned to the worth of things, uh, concepts of trade and economy. One of his major goals, of course, was to barter in material collections for the uh, museum sponsoring his expedition. So as a participant in this economy, he digs deep into Inuinite valuation of materials and time, into their trade routes and the, the subtleties of their sharing relationships. This is all really valuable information to the Katakmit Heritage Society. So in 2018, we began considering what an Inuinite-driven economy might look like. Uh, we, we incorporated a social enterprise uh, through which we began exploring how Inuinite culture can be used as a foundation for, for new business models. So our first product is Kapitiak, uh, which means good coffee in Inuinaktun. The, the elders named it. <laughs> um, we really wanted to create a, a product that everyone in the Arctic consumes and, and could be supporting. So it's really an ongoing project to, to structure this company in response to Inuit cultural values and priorities as opposed to more global models for commercial enterprise. So to date, we've set up an international supply chain that prioritizes indigenous entrepreneurs from growing the coffee to roasting and distribution to designing our packaging and merchandise. Uh, Inuaktun is, is front and center in all of these endeavors. Um, I believe it's the only packaging and labeling to date that, that includes this language. The company is guided by a board of elders and community members, um, specifically to return to think about it as a, a company that benefits the community. Um, so each year, 75% of the company's profits are, are dispersed in the community to support culture and language programming. So one of the interesting things about Kapitiak is how the product has become more about Inuit culture than, than coffee itself. And I think this really comes through in a series of short commercials that uh, were recently created for us. So instead of hiring kind of a southern marketing firm to develop our ads, uh, we invested in, in a workshop to train local youth in, in commercial videography. Um, so, uh, <coughs> sorry. The assignment for each participant was to design a promotional video for Kapitiak that, that really expressed what the company means to them. And I'll show one of these videos now. seen a coffee ad look like this down south, so it's, it's definitely something unique that's being created. So over the next several months in my Fulbright, uh, one of my focuses will be on retrieving information from Stephenson's writing that, that will really help us strengthen our social enterprise according to traditional practices of governance, uh, trade, and reciprocity. So the final case study quite literally focuses on how Inuinite can rebuild the North. Since 2016, we've been recovering and documenting Inuinite architectural concepts, uh, principles, and terminology through conversations and workshops with local elders and, and experts. For centuries, Inuinite were literally at home on the land, uh, with their surrounding environment providing everything they needed to survive the extreme climate of the Arctic. Uh, Stephenson documented a significant amount of information about these. Um, from the temporary summer dwellings that were being used, 
um, to the materials and the spatial concepts of traditional igluit. Um, so this is actually, interestingly enough, a rare drawing from Rudolf Anderson uh, that shows up in a Stephenson journal. Um, you don't see much from him. Um, to looking at these buildings through architectural lenses, so naming, naming the parts, identifying their functions. So the buildings that Inu and Knight now occupy uh, in towns are, are high cost, uh, made with low grade and imported materials, and often configured in designs not suited to their culture, lifestyle, or climate. Uh, this really directly impacts their residents' uh, mental and physical health. So we've been using historical recordings of vernacular architecture and cultural space uh, sourced from archives to help rethink what buildings could look like in the Arctic. Last year, we partnered with the Green Buildings Technology Center at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology to begin uh, bridging these traditional concepts with the cutting edge in renewable and energy efficient materials and technologies. Um, so here are uh, blueprints for our first building. Um, it's kind of interesting, they originated in Inuinaktun before they were in English. Um, so these spaces were defined through the language. Um, uh, the, the building is called Kugalak, um, which is slated for construction in Cambridge Bay this fall. So it combines first-hand recollections of elders, uh, the archival records I mentioned, and archaeological research, and it uses them to design a building that is distinctly Inuinait. It functions as both a customized cultural production facility, so for things like sewing, tool making, uh, meat preparation, but also a means to pilot and monitor uh, climate adaptive technologies that have never been trialed in the Arctic before. Here's a 3D rendering of the space. Um, so the building really functions on, on the principles of, of Inuit architecture. It's a uh, southeastern position um, and large photovoltaic awning, uh, actively absorb the sun's heat during colder months and minimize passive solar overheating during summer. Its design centers around a large circular room for collective activity and homage to the igloo. Uh, and it incorporates traditional features such as cold air buffers, natural lighting, and intuitive response to wind direction and natural topography. So here's a picture of Stephenson living off the land. In 1910, while living among the Inuinite, Stephenson reflected on the future of his daily journal entries. I find it difficult, he wrote, to keep in mind the possibility that this record may sometime be worked out by someone other than myself, and that entries sufficient for my purposes may not be of much significance to another. There's no really questioning the significance of Stephenson's writings. He was a highly skilled explorer, a competent researcher, and a passionate advocate of the Arctic. But whether or not his field notes gain significance beyond his purposes is another question entirely. Stephenson's writing was very much a product of his era and discipline. It followed certain assumptions about social and cultural progress, the role of anthropology, and the need for civilization, with a capital C, to further enhance the North. While his writing respected and honored Inuit ingenuity and traditions, he ultimately saw them as belonging to the past, uh, something bound to be replaced. The initiatives being led by the Kitakumet Heritage Society make a strong case for the future of Inuit knowledge. In working with the Stephenson collections, they're not only re returning the information to communities, but reawakening it. They're bringing it back into daily life and using it as a foundation to innovate new ways of living in the Arctic ways that are more aligned to the environment, uh, the people, and their priorities. Today's lecture is really focused on Inuit knowledge and potential inherent in Stephenson's documentation of his, his uh, Arctic expeditions. But we have to remember that this is only a minute portion of Dartmouth Stephenson polar collections. Robert Peary, Nud Rasmussen, uh, George Hubert Wilkins, just to name a few of the Arctic explorers and researchers whose diaries, photographs, and recordings of Inuit lives are also present within these collections. There's Inuit knowledge that sleeps in all of them, just waiting to be roused. As more of this documentation returns to source communities, digitally or otherwise, the greater the potential for them to inform new, distinctly Inuit trajectories for the Canadian Arctic. Thank you. Here's the, we're excited. Uh, a 
I'll try not to do the feedback. I um, don't see anything online just yet. I wanted to ask if there are any questions in the room for uh, Dr. Grebel. Thank you so much. I've written down so much. <laughs> any questions from the group here? Yeah? Oh, wait one sec for the, the microphone. Hey, um, so I'm totally impressed with what you've dug out of the collection so far and the way you're using it. I'm, that's, I'm sort of in awe of that interface and the way that was working. That is, that is so cool. Thank you. Um, the, um, the question I have is, you alluded to it, but, but I, I'm still puzzling over how you're managing on a regular basis to do it. Stevenson goes in there with, you know, a lot of preconceived notions and a lot of uh, cultural frameworks that... Um, that dictate the, what he sees, obviously, and the way he records it, and and what he, you know, how he interprets things. Those sit in the diary for a hundred years, and and now you're coming in with a different set of frameworks, um, a different set of assumptions, and a different set of knowledge, and you're looking at those, and you're trying to to pluck out what was before the two of you, right? In a sense. And I'm curious about how, what your methodology is for trying to find the nugget of the original being, after being filtered through Stephenson, who's, you know, not, you know, he's got a lot going on with, with the way he sees things. And then yourself as well. Yeah, no, great question. Um, so a lot of... It's always a little tricky because I don't have the Inuit elders down here with me to be guiding, directly guiding this work. Um, but I do have 15 years of experience at the organization. I know what people are looking for, um, names, for example. Uh, but they're also names in an orthography, in Stephenson's own orthography. So he's taking a spoken language, running it into an orthography based on how he thinks it might be spoken. Uh, he does create keys to it. Um, and so it's this process of, of manually documenting these, pulling them all out in their original orthography, pulling out the keys to them, um, and then bringing them back up north and having elders with a, a strong knowledge of the language work through them and move them into the contemporary orthography of the Arctic. Um, uh, Inuinaktu now has a, a Roman orthography. Um, and then them Pro further processing that towards specific uses. So I'm, I'm just a, a small cog in all of this um, that is uh, on the front lines. And I, I use, I mean, the photos are a great example. Um, there's thousands of these photos, um, all of them dated wrong in the system uh, digitally. It's, it's, it uses a series of dates that were just implemented for everything. Um, so where I can be helpful in a process like this is by doing my research to figure out who those individuals are, where he was, at what times, the date ranges that would have put him in an Inuinite region, um, anything with people in, I can tell. I, can, I know their outfits, I know their, their styles of making things. We can put that in the, whoops, in the Inuinite pile, if you will, to, to send back up north. But it's a lot of um, very detailed background research that has to be done to start figuring out what to isolate and what not. So how do you scale up? Because as you say, there's tons more stuff in the Stephenson collection and then there's tons of stuff in collections around the world. How, you're an amazing researcher of able to pluck this stuff out. How do you scale up to sort of gather, gather it all? By getting museums to do it for okay. us. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, more and more that's happening. I mean, 10 years ago, extracting a digital record from a museum was like pulling teeth. Now, everyone believed that a digital record or a photo of an object was the same as that object and was under the custodianship of that institution. Um, and now, museums are looking to give these away. Um, they're looking to put them in Creative Commons licensing. Um, I mean, we're breaking these records open and rewriting into them, which, which would be so scary for uh, someone in a museum or archives 10 years ago, the possibility of other people changing their records. Um, but I mean, I think the more museums we work with, we form these really deep relationships with them. And they, they are in these records every day and, and offering it up to us. Um, so it's a matter of kind of co-opting organizations and their staff. And the more people that know about it, the more people find things and suggest them forwards. And it all kind of streams up to the Arctic where, where these actual experts can be filtering through it and finding what's useful for their needs. 
I have um, a question from online. Um, and well, actually, a couple questions. One, I will say to you, um, you may have just answered, how do you suggest moving forward? But before that was, what do you think of the urgency of this work? Um, I mean, it's incredibly urgent, um, especially around Inunaktun language. And the, uh, as, as I mentioned in the, that starting video, it's, it's uh, the language, everyone's conscious of it disappearing. Um, and again, we, we use this term uh, it, sleeping, um, waiting to be brought back, but it's sleeping among 500 people right now. Um, so most of what we do as an organization is just everything we do is layered with this language. Um, so there's incredible urgency in that, but with the, the elders we work with up there, um, who are 70, 80 years old, they're, they're literally the last generation to have grown up on the land with some understanding of the, the total experience. So they might have not made a lot of traditional tools themselves, but they saw them made. Um, anyone born after about the 1950s was put into residential schooling, where they were removed from their families, they were removed from their language, and then sent back to their communities with, with a blank slate for the culture almost. They, they had to be retaught everything. Um, so it's, the real sense of urgency comes with working with this very limited population of elders who have this kind of experiential knowledge of all the processes that we're trying to find. And I mean, if we'd done that, that boot project several years down the line, we would have lost Mary Kudlak, who, who was the last person who was making them. Um, so, there's kind of a, a definite urgency to bring all this documentation and to bring the people together and, and make it happen as soon as we can. Thank you, and there's, there's more coming in. Um, someone uh, noted that it's fascinating, very glad to have the opportunity to listen and learn. The assembly of the database promises to be an incredibly rich product. Um, it, seems, uh, it seems that in some extent it's being built in a process akin to Wikipedia. What sort of but concerning what is what sort of oversight or moderation can occur or should occur before each contribution is embedded into that database? Does it already have a moderation, or is there something that's being done? Sort of. So uh, I mean, you you need to be a defined user to. I mean, you can. One of our priorities was that anyone can access this. Anyone can go in, look at the records, open them up, see what's there. But to start manipulating them, you need to be a user. Um, and uh, as a user, you then have a, a digital identity, uh, which can help us moderate a little bit. Um, what I'm most interested in doing is, is engaging with unmoderated work on the, on the records. And that's where something like the, the tagging comes in. Um, when when we, we spit out all those files into a, a, a tagging grid, um, there's no restrictions on anything. Anyone can go in and do anything. We can decide whether to push that back into the, the kind of the higher knowledge bank uh, that it came out of to reintegrate those results. So we've got various checks and balances in terms of how we move the information back into, into the main data set. Um, but I like being able to throw it out so that uh, uh, developing a user identity is incredibly prohibitive for, for an elder or someone without a lot of digital literacy. Um, that will stop them from contributing. Um, so creating these ways that we can be, anyone can be engaging with the material, but it's not necessarily being, changing the foundational records. Um, a lot like what we're doing with other museums collections, where we'll bring in their original records, um, we'll let people make changes to them, adjust them, add things to them, but that doesn't mean they're changing in the original institution. It's up to them to, to see this record and say, okay, I want to bring that in, or this spelling's been fixed on this name, or this attribute wasn't there before, but people feel it should be there, so we're gonna, we're gonna integrate it. And we've looked at doing it automatically through APIs where, where it's just automatically updating with these systems and it's just a nightmare. So we use these kind of checks and balances of, of how we move information to the next kind of level of these grids. Uh, the Inuit Knowledge Bank will then connect to an Inuit Knowledge Bank, which will have all regions covered. And then it'll be able to put out that information for this region, and that'll be able to put it out into smaller modules that we can reconfigure as people want. I'll look around the room, and I just have one more question here that uh, uh, someone, uh, well, actually, you know Ross. He asks, says, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Your focus on the importance of language retention and revitalization is central to the overall vitality of northern communities. Question, how do you see this working on the ground? What resources are needed? And how do you see the archival materials contributing to this effort? So it's a big question of sort of how do we, how do we move forward with the resources? And uh, what, what do you need for this? What is needed? 
oh, we've been doing it for 10 years. We don't need anything. <laughs> I mean, we need more funding, of course. Um, and we need, we need the compliance of organizations to be filtering in these little bits of information that help, that help the, the real people doing this project, the, the elders and the community members and the experts up north, develop a larger vision around what they want to do. Um, this is going on whether we facilitate it or not, but we can, we can choose to put this effort in to kind of make that end effort much stronger. And, and so I, I, will, I will go further on that as just saying, in the, in, the, in the course of how you've been working on this, do you think this is a, a good model to have people come, such as yourself or someone else from a community, come and do this work and present it and make it wake up folks to the fact that this, this knowledge needs to be woken up? Is this something that should be done more often? Because it's just you right now, right? Or a few, a few Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, it's me, but I mean, it, it's, the idea would be to have someone in, a, in this position um, who, who has kind of more of a firsthand knowledge of, around a lot of these materials or has a personal project that they're working on and can be actively finding all these little details that make sense to them. Um, I can find broad details and direct them to different projects that I know are of importance to the elders uh, who are on our board as an organization and the different projects that we're doing. But um, I mean, it, it really needs to be Inuit and indigenous scholars in the center finding the stuff directly um, uh, rather than someone like myself. I will thank you and I will leave it at that for now. I will say thank you again. And you've inspired, as you know, you've inspired me to think on all sorts of different levels and even how we think about the digital structures, which you didn't get into as much here or you showed us, but we've had conversations of, of how the digital infrastructures should not be also just thought of by Western folks. How are we? as your indigenous, uh, the knowledge bank showed, or the Inuit knowledge bank showed, how do you involve more people in just thinking about these infrastructures for knowledge uh, generation? It's just uh, how you're thinking on so many different levels of how to make these meaningful engagements and really connect to the communities, as I said, in the co-production of knowledge. You've pushed me to think very differently, and you're actively doing it, and you're showcasing how it can be done and the best the, the practices that I hope we can all learn from. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you all for being here. And all you folks online, I see almost more than 40 were here for most of it. So Great. thank you again, and uh, we'll talk more. <laughs> Take Sounds care. Lovely. Bye. Thank you very much.